Um, thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be at the Institute. Um, all right, so let me begin by briefly recalling the definition of uh, Gauss uniformity norms. So I'll need to set up some notation. So for uh, the remaining of introduction, G will stand for a finite uh, abelian group. Later, we'll specialize to Fp to the n, and finally, we'll end up at F to the n. So, but for now, it's just finite abelian group. And let the ball D stand for the unit disk in the complex plane. So, just all that with modulus and plus one. Um, so, now let me give the definition of uh, the Gauss uniformity norms. So, uh, for people who haven't seen these already, uh, it might be scary, but don't be too much too frightened. So I'll explain how, why this is nice thing. So uh, I'll need another piece of notation. So let's F from our abelian group to D or C, but let's keep D for now. Um, be a function um, given any element A in G, which we think of as a shift. We define something called the discrete multiplicative derivative of f, which is denoted like this, and it basically says shift f by a and then multiply it by f itself. Everything about it at, at x and you conjugate the second part. So and this is just a multiplicative version of the usual derivative, essentially. So uh, with this useful notation, we can now define the coverage uniformity norms. So um, uh, the covers use a form its norm um, u k of function f is given by the following expression. So what you do is you take the average over all elements in your group. So expectation is always taken over the whole group unless they say um, something different. But I, I don't think there will be any situations like that today. So we take x, which we think of as a base point, and we take k shifts, and then we apply these multiplicative derivatives k times. So you, you apply it with shift a1, you apply it with shift a2, all the way to ak, and you write it at the dex. So if you think about it here, I'll actually get a product of two to k terms. So I need to take the power of one or two to k to get something which can be called the norm right at the end. So this is the definition. It's not immediately obvious from the definition that this is actually a norm, but it can be checked. So let me just mention that, that this is a norm. And maybe is it uh, clear that it's a real number? Uh yeah, because if you conjugate this is actually and taking averages like this, uh that basically means that you end up with some. Uh, squares of modulus of things. So if you think about, let's let's say that you pull out AK outside, uh, then you would get actually the square of this thing with modulus squared. So it will be a real number actually. Yeah, because it's a square of modulus, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the less obvious thing is that it's actually, um, that it satisfies triangle inequality, but. It turns out that's <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to say is that because I introduced a lot of notation here, it might not be obvious that this is a um, useful combinatorial thing. But if you, for example, k, take k equals three and you think what about what we did with these shifts and multiplicative derivatives, we actually fix a point x first and then we say let's shift by. Let's call it vector a1 to x plus a1. And then we might take another shift to both of these points. So maybe a2 like this. So we get x plus a2. And here we get x plus a1 plus a2. And maybe another shift if k is 3. So we might get something which resembles a parallel So this is xa plus uh, x plus a3 all the way to x plus a1 plus a2 plus a3. And this is something called an additive cube. So it's a nice combinatorial object. And what we're actually doing is we're averaging over all these nice additive cubes and evaluating 
f at all these vertices and taking an appropriate product with conjugates. But it's a combinator of awesome. that's, that's my point. So we won't worry too much about this expression uh, in the rest of the talk. Anyway, so the reason why uh, uniformity norms are useful lies in the fact that they actually, if your uniformity norm is small, then your function actually behaves like a randomly chosen function when it comes to counting objects of complexity at most k minus one. So I won't say what the complexity means. I won't need it for this talk, but for example, in uh, the context of arithmetic progressions where a uh, team introduced these norms, uh, arithmetic, prog arithmetic progression line k actually has complexity at most k minus one because it's simply defined by k minus two linear equations. So it's a meaningful thing. All right, so an important question in additive combinatorics in general, and especially when it comes to uniformity norms, is the so-called inverse question uh, for uniformity norms. And it asks for a description of those functions whose uniformity norm is large. So f takes values in the unit disk. So this is always the most one. Um, and one way to phrase it would be to ask for, so what do we want? We want a family, um, let's call it Q of so-called, let's call them abstraction functions. Um, maybe it's small Q from G to D, uh, which have the following properties. So the first property would be, well, if your function has large uniformity norm, uh, then you actually need to come from these abstractions, meaning that you get significant correlation with your abstraction, some of these abstractions. So this one's again ever covered the whole group. So we are looking um, at global abstractions. And the second requirements not to make things silly would be uh, that this, this family Q is roughly minimal. So we don't want to put all possible functions here. Right? Uh, so Q needs to be roughly minimal in the sense that we have the opposite direction of implication. So if, for example, F correlates with some abstraction function, uh, so let's have C prime here. Uh, then actually F necessarily has large uniformity norm, depending on the term. So these abstractions depend on K, but I haven't specified it. Now I'll say something about what's known about this inverse question. So I'll say uh, what happens for a particular groups. So the two groups for which this question was most studied are the cycle group and uh, the vector space case. So fp to the end, where p is fixed and is going to infinite essentially. Uh, so let me begin by mentioning results. So I'll now mention uh, many results. So first result that I'd like to mention is by Ferguson, uh, Tal, and Ziegler. from 2009, who proves the vector space case. Uh, and now I'll mention an important uh, condition. We need to assume in this particular result that P is at least K, and this is called the high characteristic case. So let's give it a name. So it's this particular bound that P is at least K. And in their case, they could take phase functions of polynomials as abstraction functions. So phase functions of polynomials. And if K is the order of our norm, these are polynomials of degree at most K minus one. Okay. And later, Tao and Siegler improved this theorem. Um, they generalized this to. So this was uh, two years later. This was once again a P to the N, and now there is no uh, restriction on P, so general P. But let me stress that P can be less than K, which is known as the low characteristic case. 
And now the abstractions are no longer phases of polynomials, but rather phases of something called uh, non-classical polynomials. Of degree once again at most uh, k minus one. And let me briefly say that these phase functions of non-classical polynomials are actually very natural in the sense that they solve the extremal problem. So if you try to solve the problem of having f from f p to the n to the unit disk, which has the maximal possible uniformity norm, you actually get exactly the phase functions of non-classical polynomials here. So it's a very natural thing to consider. And I won't say the, ex I mean, this is already the definition of it, but there is also a very nice algebraic description. And these turns out, these, um, this family of functions turns out to be very nice family on its own, but I won't say of what the algebraic description is. So in my talk, we'll actually use them sort of as a black box. So they, they're nice objects, they live somewhere, but we actually won't need an explicit description of them. Okay, so this is Bert and Tony Ziegler from 2011. Uh, there is, uh, when it comes to the cipher groups, there is the result of uh, Green, Tony and Ziegler from 2010. Um, so it's cipher group, um, and the abstraction family is something called Neal sequences, which I won't need in my talk. And now the difference is, is actually that these are no longer solutions to extremal problems. So that's the reason why I had to say that, uh, to phrase the inverse question in this form. So the first guess would be, well, just take the extremal solutions as absorption functions, but that doesn't work in cyclic groups. Um, all right, so those are uh, the first results that prove these inverse theorems. And let me just very briefly mention another approach uh, called the nail space theory, uh, where there are many works of, so I'll, I'll just mention people who worked on um, these things. So it's Segedi, then Kamarena and Segedi had uh, another paper on nail space theory, uh, then Candela had additional, um, modifications of the theory, and then there is a group of Gutmann, Manners, and Varju, uh, who also had important contributions to this theory. And the reason why I'm mentioning is uh, last year, um, so it's um, Candela, uh, Gonzalez, Sanchez. Um, and Segedi uh, gave another proof of uh, the Tau Ziegler theorem, which is the most relevant for me today. Um, so they gave additional proof of FP to the end in 2000. Uh, all right, so all these results that I mentioned so far are ineffective because they either rely on, on infinitary methods or regularity dilemmas or arguments of those types. So um, when it comes to quantitative bounds, uh, we first of all have uh, results of uh, Green and Tau, who proved uh, the U3 case um, in almost all finite building groups, uh, except that they needed G to be of all the order. So this was 2005. Um, and roughly at the same time, somewhat of Nitsky. So let's put 2005 here. Um, also did the U3 case, but in sort of the remaining case in F2. So the opposite case. So that's U3. And then um, in 2017, uh, Tim and myself, we proved uh, the inner theorem for U4 norm, which was quantitative in FP to the N, with 
the high characteristic assumption, but because k is four here, that means that p needs to uh, needs to be just five based. So this was 2017, and actually last year, uh, Tito uh, extended this to the low characteristic. So this was 2021. Then in 2018, we have the work of manners um, improved all norms, um, the intersection for all norms in the cyclic group case. And finally, uh, when it comes to uh, previous results, Tim and myself we proved in 2020, here's theorem for UK norms. Uh, in FP to the N in the high characteristics case as well. So P once again needs to be at least K. And the last thing which remains open, sort of, is the question of uh, constitutive bounds. In low characteristics. So this is still open. And my main result today is a contribution to this problem. Um, so let's say um, u u five and u six in f to the n. It's fine. So I won't spell out the full thing. So it means that if your u five norm in f to the n is large, then you correlate with space functional and non-classic polynomial. What did you guess? All right, and at the end of the talk, I'll say something about why this kind, this work and the methodology in this work almost gets you to the whole inverse theorem. Uh, but uh, let's um, let's keep that for the last part. All right, so now I'll start going into the proof, sort of. And I need to recall some previous work. So um, uh, when Tim and I worked on the UK case in the high characteristic, we actually got a partial result which works independently of the characteristic. So I'll say now what the result is. Um, so this is a theorem. Uh, if, so let's now say that we specialize to have P to the N. So P is not yet two, but it will become soon. So. Uh, if F has large uniformity norm, order K, um, then there exists a multilinear form. So, um, so this is just a function from, so let, let me see, multilinear form alpha from G to K minus one. So it has K minus one variables and being a four means that it's, its image is just a field, and we are linear in each of the variables, um, such that. So now we'll have the same expression almost from the definition of the uniformity norm. So we take, instead of taking k shifts, which we needed for uk norm, we actually take k minus one shifts. We apply the discrete multiplicative derivatives. So this would be the expression which defines the norm of order k minus one, which is some gain. And if I write omega for the piece root of unity, so into two pi i over p, and put alpha here with k minus one variables, this has significant correlation. So this is quantitative; it bounds the number of uh, bounds the number of exponentials. Okay. So this says. Uh, this thing, which would define um, a norm for which we know the inverse theorem by induction, for example, that correlates with a very structured function. Okay, and this is independent of the characteristic. So it's a natural thing to do uh, to try to use this condition and then to conclude the inverse theorem. So let me give this condition name star because it will be vital for the rest of the talk. And let me say how one deduces 
the high curvature is the case from this. Uh, it will actually be surprisingly short. And before I do that, I need to briefly recall some of the terms which we had in the previous couple of days about partition rank bias. So I guess everyone knows everything about this already, but uh, let's just um, keep it here. So uh, if we're given a multilinear form in k variables, we can define partition rank as follows. So if beta has variables x1 up to xk, this is the least number r, such that I can write beta as a sum of r terms, which are actually products of two forms of small order. And actually, I would like to have um, partition variables. So we have some subset of variables here, a proper subset, but not empty set. And here I might have, not I might have, I actually need to have its complement. So it's not just saying I have fewer variables here and fewer variables here, but it's actually a, a nice uh, decomposition. So that's an algebraic measure of structure. So let's put it that way. And an analytic version of that would be, easiest one would be bias, which is just um, defined to be as the expectation of the phase function of beta. So like, um, like it occurs in the past, uh, past couple of days, so this measure actually tells you how much the distribution of values of beta the, um, is far from being uniform. So it basically counts how many more zeros you have than other values. And the crucial result here um, would be the partition versus analytic rank problem. Uh, but um, in the context of um, this work, I like to think about it as the inverse theorem for biased multilinear maps. So it really describes those maps that have large parts. Inverse theorem for biased multilinear uh, forms. And this, as we've heard, um, has a long a list of names. So Green and Tao in 2008 first proved this kind of theorem for polynomials. Then Baumann and Lovett extended their theorem uh, to be independent of the field in 2015. But the issue was uh, these proofs were non-effective. And then uh, Jonser and myself independently in 2019 got polynomial bounds, and this was um, improved two days ago by Moshkovitz and Ju. So 2022. And it basically says if bias of alpha is at least C, then partition rank is small. So basically, the only way you're not around the map is by being this kind of map, and that's all. So uh, then the partition rank of alpha is at most um, log C inverse to some power. Now, this power can be one plus epsilon, essentially. But for the purposes of my talk, it actually doesn't matter. So maybe exactly linear bounds would improve the number of exponentials, but I'm not so sure. So uh, yeah, so we'll use that as a plan. <clears throat> All right, so we now have to return to this star condition and to see how to conclude the proof of the inverse theorem in the high characteristic case. So going from star, um, which is now very far away, so maybe I should write it down again. Uh, so x, a1 up to a, k minus 1. Uh, these multiplicative derivatives of f, and the phase function of our multilinear form. So this is significant correlation. And now we have to study this multilinear form here, and we hope that 
by using this structure that we obtain here, we can actually get phase function of a polynomial that correlates with that. So that's our goal. And the first step is something called the green tau symmetry argument, uh, which says that if I look at alpha and I look at alpha with any uh, permutation applied to the variables, uh, those two forms that they get are actually not far from each other. So alpha is almost symmetric. So if we combine their arguments with the theorem for bias multilinear maps, we can say something like this. So partition rank of alpha minus alpha composed with pi. So maybe I should say what this is. This is natural action of the symmetric group on alpha. So um, if I write alpha composed with pi plus one up to xk, this would be just alpha of p inverse applied to one uh, p inverse applied to k. So this is the right in the sense of direction. So it's right action. So we have inverses here. So anyway, this is small. So we can say that alpha is approximately symmetric. And this step here works in the benefit of the characteristic cell, which is good. And step two is, uh, well, if you look at approximately symmetric forms, our usual intuition from additive combinatorics is, well, the only thing, uh, the only way these things can happen is by being symmetric and then adding some kind of error term, right? So the hope is, well, alpha needs to be symmetric multilinear form plus low partition rank form. And this is actually very easy to do if you assume that P is at least K. So let me stress this. And then what one considers is does the average overall uh, permutations apply to alpha? Okay, so let's just look at this form. It's naturally symmetric. And because all these guys differ from alpha by low partition rank forms, uh, this form itself, which is symmetric, differs from alpha by small position. Okay. And then we want to plug in sigma instead of alpha here, but that's easy to do. It turns out that this condition here, the star condition is robust. So if you modify alpha by low partition rank forms, this value changes a bit, but that's all that happens. So maybe let's add this as step three uh, using robustness of star. And then once we have a symmetric multilinear form, it turns out that once again in high characteristic, symmetric multilinear forms are of course very closely related to polynomials, right? As we know, so um, sigma way one up to AK is actually necessarily coming from um, um, an additive derivative of some polynomial Q. So this is additive derivative. You know? This is the usual uh, kind of identity that we have with multilinear forms. And then we're basically done. So we can actually go to start condition and now it's no longer alpha, it's no longer sigma, but it's rather an additive derivative of Q. And then we actually consume omega to q into f and then we are just um we just end up with k minus one multiplicative errors and that's exactly applying the identity uh inductive hypothesis so maybe at step five which says applying inductive hypothesis okay so if one looks at this proof it's short and the only parts which depend on the high characteristic assumption are actually quite easy right so this was sort of trivial first thing to try. And this thing is just a well-known identity. Right? So the question is how to now modify this argument to work in low characteristic as well. So in the local characteristic, Kidor um, observed the following two things. So the step two, in the case when, so when k is four, which is his work, that means that we're working with k minus one variables, meaning trilinear forms. 
it turns out that step two works for trilinear forms. So you, you cannot do the same trick because this is divisible by um, two. So maybe let's now pass that to the end and stay here for the rest of the talk. Uh, but this says that approximately symmetric multilinear forms or uh, approximately symmetric trilinear forms are always of the shape exactly symmetric plus low partition rank error term. Okay, so this still works. And the step four, it turns out that one can actually go to the work of uh, Tal and Siegler, and then to use that sort of, sort of arguments to give uh, an algebraic characterization once again of additive derivatives, but no longer of polynomials, but rather non-classical polynomials, which we need for the inverse theorem. So for that thing, I need additional uh, definitions. So we say that a multilinear form um, sigma, which is um, let's say, let's say it has k variables and it's to f two now, is strongly symmetric. If sigma is itself symmetric, okay. So that is the natural thing to be able to do. But it's not only symmetric, but it sets up as additional condition. So if we put two u's instead of the first two variables, so let's make them equal, and then take uh, remaining variables. So this is now a function in k minus one variables. But because sigma was symmetric in the first two, this is still a multilinear form. Right, so this is the same thing as Frobenius homomorphism. So uh, this is multilinear form in uh, k minus one variables, and the condition is that the, this new multilinear form is also symmetric. So strongly symmetric means you are itself symmetric, and this additional form is symmetric. And then there is proposition by either to prove that. Um, uh, let's say strongly symmetric multilinear forms uh, are exactly deterated additive derivatives of non classical polynomials. So just the thing which we need. Okay. And this proposition, it actually works uh, for any P, any degree. So actually the only weird step is step two. So just passing from approximately symmetric forms to exactly symmetric. So Tidor actually asked, uh, what about step two for higher degrees, higher rarities? Um, What about approximately symmetric forms in more than three variables? And the hope is, well, maybe we cannot use the polarization identically like before, but uh, maybe the theorem is still true. Maybe the only approximately symmetric multilinear forms are actually symmetric plus an error term. And this actually turns out to be false already for four variables. So this is a uh, counterexample from last year. Actually, there are, so let's say there is a multilinear form alpha in four variables. So four copies of F, sorry, not Fd, but F2 to the N, F2 to the N, F2 to the N, F2. Uh, which is uh, symmetric in first three variables, so x1, x2, and x3, 
uh, partition rank difference. So because we're in F2, I'll just write plus and maybe I'll say subtract or, the, or difference, but that's fine. So if we swap three and four, this partition rank is at most three, so it's extremely small. But this form is very far from any symmetric multiple. Okay. So, but precision rank of alpha plus sigma is at least um, actually cube root of n uh, for any exactly symmetric multilinear form. Okay, so that's sort of although this proof is relatively short, everything is natural. There's this one annoying step which fails completely for four variables already. So the main question, or let's say the main problem, is basically the following. So if the star condition holds, so if um, we have this expectation, so let me now put k variables instead of k minus one because we are now just focusing on this problem. And this is no longer omega, but just minus one to our form. Uh, then one needs to conclude that alpha equals strongly symmetric uh, plus low partition rank. So something which depends on C only partition rank multilinear form. Okay, and we need reasonable bounds here in order to get quantitative inverse theorem, right? So this actually, the main problem follows immediately from uh, Tau and Ziegler's work, of course, in qualitative sense. So you just apply in order but yeah, we need this with uh, quantitative bounds. Okay, so let me now briefly say how one avoids this difficulty in the case of four variables, the difficulty coming from this annoying counterexample. Okay, so four variables and four variables that corresponds to U5 now. So five variables is uh, for U6. Um, so this is something we can call algebraic uh, regularity method. So it's, it fits in within quasi-randomness versus structure uh, paradigm, but it's also very closely related to regularity method itself. But the difference is we can get good bounds by using um, the algebraic structure. So we can actually use the inverse theorem for biased multilinear forms as our regularity lemma, essentially. And it will be not as strong as the usual graph theoretic regularity lemma, but it will be sufficiently strong for our purposes in these kinds of problems. Uh, but in case of four val variables, it's, this will actually be much easier. We won't need the full strength of the inverse theorem. We actually won't need the inverse theorem for bias multilinear forms. We need it for five variables. And so what one can prove, so let's, let's go step by step. So uh, even though, we have this kind of counterexample. It's still natural to do these approximate to exact properties things for multilinear forms. So the first thing that we need to prove is the following. So suppose that alpha, this works in any number of variables, but let's say in four variables, is only approximately symmetric in the first two variables. So um, satisfies partition rank of alpha plus alpha with one and two spots is at most r. Uh, and it turns out that, that in this case, we can still recover uh, the exact symmetric form. So then there exists a multilinear form uh, alpha prime, also in four variables, uh, such that alpha prime is symmetric in the first two variables. 
and the partition rank is off. Uh, the partition rank of the difference between half and half. And this is about the number of exponentials, maybe two exponentials. Maybe for four variables, this can be even more efficient, but that's it. So that basically says that if we go back to the star condition, and using robustness of star condition, that means that in the first step, we can actually make sure that alpha above is actually exactly symmetric in the first two variables. So the natural way to go is, well, let's go to the star condition in each step and let's uh, ensure that our alpha is more and more symmetric. So the first step was it, it was approximately symmetric. Now it's exactly symmetric in the first two. Now we hope to be exactly symmetric in the first three and finally in the first four or all four, sorry. So to get exact symmetry in the three variables, it turns out once again to be trivial because three is odd. So uh, for three variables, what one does is knowing that alpha is already symmetric in the first two, we can just consider alpha with the first three variables shifted each time. So x four stays at the same place, and the first three get shifted. So now, because alpha was symmetric already in the first two, this is exact. This is exactly symmetric in the first three, and because there are, there is an odd number of alphas, it actually differs from alpha by a low prediction. So this is a deep trick, a trick in this case. So actually, this works, of course, for any odd number of variables. Okay. And then the question is finally how to get to four variables, which in the light of this counterexample is you can't do it directly, right? It says that this is symmetric already in the first three. It has very small partition rank of this difference, which we, which is our only assumption. So we, we cannot hope to get all four variables, a symmetry on all four variables. But it turns out that we then an additional natural condition we can. So suppose that alpha is uh, symmetric in x1, x2, and x3. So this is for uh, forms in four variables. Uh, the partition rank of alpha plus alpha composed with t4 is the most r. And that. Um, and this is the crucial assumption. So let's put again two variable, uh, two copies of a single variable in the first two places. And the assumption is that this is always zero. Okay. And then the conclusion is then alpha is once again close to, uh, close to exactly symmetric. Uh, multilinear form. So we need this additional condition here. Okay. And this condition might look strange at first, but it actually uh, it can be concluded by additive combinatorial arguments from the star condition above. So I don't have time to say how that happens, but um, let, let's just keep it here. So in the last 10 minutes, I'll so let me you now in five minutes say how one proves this, and then in the last five minutes, what happens for general people. So what one does is we can actually prove the following easy lemma. So this is something called symmetric, symmetry respecting regularity lemma for bilinear forms. If you're expecting by linear regularity lemma. And it says the following. So suppose that gamma one up to gamma r are given by linear forms. Um, and the conclusion is, well, then there exists a subspace U of co-dimension, which is reasonably bounded, 
So maybe if one tosses in here a parameter d, um, one can get a polynomial bound. Um, and two lists of bilinear forms. So let's call them sigma, sigma one up to sigma s. Uh, no longer on G, but on U for technical reasons. Row one up to row T, also on U. And these two lists combined are not longer than this list. So S plus P is at most R. And the conditions are the following. So the first thing is, these are not arbitrary but linear forms. They actually come from gammas. So each sigma I or O I is a linear combination of rho j restricted to u times u. Oh, sorry, not rho j, but gamma. But that's not the interesting one. Uh, turns out that all these sigma, sigma i's are exactly symmetric. So uh, symmetric. Um, these guys are not symmetric, and rho should indicate that they are random-like. So the exact condition is any non-trivial uh, linear combination of sigma i, rho i, and rho i with its variables swapped has large rank, as rank. And this is, I'm saying rank because these are bilinear forms, so this is matrix rank, right? So, um, R to D for technical reasons. And finally, one can express the original bilinear forms in terms of sigma i's and rho i's. Gamma i is linear combination of sigma i, rho i, rho i with one and two so. Okay. Let me now just see how this is relevant. So let's go to our condition that alpha is almost symmetric in the last two variables. So this has low partition rank. So that means that it's a sum of products of either two bilinear forms or single variable and then three variables, right? But it turns out that single variable forms are quite nice because I can just go to the subspace, which is defined by all of them. So I can basically always forget about these guys. So I always have two variables here, maybe x1, x3, maybe x2, x4, and other three possibilities. Or um, at this moment, we are not interested in order. So what one does is we take um, all these bilinear forms that appear here and apply this regularity lemma to them. So what that does is that we can actually, these are our starting bilinear forms. So by property four, we can actually pass here to just having these forms sigma and rho i. Okay, so this will become, I don't know, some linear combination of sigma i's with some choices of variables here, then sigma i and sigma j with i less than j, et cetera. So I might get sigma and rho, some mixed um, case, and rho i, rho i, and rho i, rho j. And what they need to do is to get rid of all these possibilities. So it turns out that one can do this um, without this uh, highlighted condition here for all cases, except, uh, except for this case here. So when you have exactly two copies of the same symmetric form. Okay, and this condition here actually serves to kill off this case. So that's basically the way you prove this for uh, four form uh, four uh, variables. And let me now just say very briefly what is in more than four variables, or maybe just say one comment and then one conjecture. So for more than four variables, uh, for k more than four, 
We can also prove this kind of symmetry respecting uh, regularity lemma. But the issue is, um, the only issue is that there, there is one specific kind of um, new example form. So something called partially symmetric forms. Um, so this is some very specific phenomenal forms, but they don't turn out to be any problem in the rest of the proof. So one can do these kinds of arguments where more than four variables. And the only place where you're stuck is once again, when you have these pro products of exactly the same symmetric form, okay? So in the case of five variables, you are done by the same trick because when you, when K is five, you can only have two variables here, two four variables here, and a single variable here. So you once again kill these terms in a cheap way. But this problem uh, with two copies of the symmetric form persists in hierarchies. And you cannot no longer, for algebraic reasons, kill it by a simple condition. So really, the only problem which remains to be solved is the following um, problem conjecture. So suppose, so I'll, I'll state this in um, the cleanest possible. Multilinear form in two two k variables. Uh, sorry, two k variables, um, and the sigma is a form in k variables, so half of the variables here, and this one is exactly symmetric. So these are multilinear forms such that, uh, first of all, alpha is almost symmetric. It's actually symmetric in the first two k minus one variables. So x1 up to x2 k minus 1. Um, and secondly, maybe I should write it below. Try to do low. Uh, so when you take alpha in x1 up to x2 k and you add alpha with the last two variables swapped. So x2k and then x2k minus one like before. This has the following shape. So you take two copies of sigma, you put x2k minus one in one copy, x2k in the second copy. So these two guys are always separated. And you take all possible combinations like this. So that means that you take k minus one variables here, the remaining k minus one variables here. So I is always a set of size k minus one. So all possible combinations here. So this is some very specific alpha. Um, and suppose that the star condition holds for some f. So that means the correlation of uh, uh, shorter product of um, multiplicative derivatives uh, with phase function of alpha. And the conclusion is, well, the only way this can happen is if bias of sigma is actually large, maybe for constancy. So what this means is that actually this kind of product can be, by using the theorem for bias non-linear forms, these can split further. And that's the case we can actually solve because these are actually no longer proper products of two symmetric forms. So solving this conjecture should give uh, the whole uh, inverse theorem in low characteristic in F to the end. So let me uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Can you say something about what happens in larger fields? So yes. uh -huh. uh, well, my um, my guess is, is that this is sort of the hardest case, I mean, or exactly as hard as others. So I would say that it should be maybe more uh, technically demanding, but uh, we use, I mean, I use uh, not very much about F to, to the end here. So I use it only at a couple of places for natural things. So one place where you use it is looking at this kind of form. So if you name it phi, 
uh, phi is actually necessarily symmetric in the first two variables because you don't um, you do not swap them at all. Phi is also symmetric in three and four because you're adding alpha to alpha with three and four swaps. And phi actually satisfies another identity from this uh, equality. So this turns out to be zero. So this is basically the only, essentially the only thing about F2 which is specific, but you should expect to get an identity like this. And maybe there is another point where one uses F2, but it, it always felt in a non-essential way. So I would be very surprised if, um, if other fields are issued. The main issue is this weird thing where you can get rid of all possible uh, products or, which involve now not only symmetric and random like forms, but partially symmetric ones, which I haven't said what they are, but you, you get a whole bunch of examples like this. And this is the only kind of product that you cannot kill off. So the, I felt that this is ex exactly the difficulty that remains. Do you have questions? Yeah, maybe about these uh, partially symmetric <laughs> forms. Are they just somehow elements in a sure factor inside? Uh -huh. uh, well, I can I can tell you what exactly what they are. So suppose that suppose that we have a form i uh, in k variables, and suppose that phi is actually symmetric in the first k minus one. And this phi actually satisfies another condition. So if you take phi and then you swap the remaining variable with all possible choices of L. So I'll put L from one to K, but taking K here means you don't do anything. There, this identity turns out to be zero. So it's some weird condition, but it's the only thing. And it turns out that even though we have this weird condition, this doesn't make any problem still. Okay. Looks like uh, something in a representation corresponding to a young diagram. Make sure some advisors. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let's thank you again. And